see you again, John Sanino and Tom King. I, uh, let me congratulate you again for making history. I, I know you had a successful meeting up there in New Jersey, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of the town. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think we had a mayor that did that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, congratulations for making history. Those of you who are governors-elect have, for the first time, increased the ranks of governors for the party in power in the White House. The first time it's happened. It wouldn't have been possible without the quality of the candidates and the fine performance of the Republican governors in that service to your colleagues. Some of you new <coughs> governors, particularly Guy Hunt and Carol Campbell. Carol. There. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, I think I have an opportunity to build a, a strong Republican Party in your states. In this campaign, I don't know about you, but going around the country, I was amazed and impressed with the percentage of young people that are now in our corner. It used to be that they wanted to lynch me when I was a Republican governor, but uh, this is different, and I think we've got a great chance for a real realignment in the future here for all the things that we believe in. We all know I sat where you were sitting once. You have one of the most important jobs in government. I, I want to make sure that Washington doesn't interfere with the way you perform. And that's why I've ordered that we, we do a, some further study on federalism, which is what we came here to re-implement, and to see what further we can do and what we have failed in our efforts to bring it about. I believe that the, this being a sovereign feder a federation of sovereign states is the greatest assurance of freedom for our people and the base of the strength of our country. And there's been too many years in which there were people in Washington that were trying to, to make you or your states, all our states, as just administrative districts of the federal government. Well, that's no way to go. So. We'll welcome all the suggestions and help that you can give us on what we're trying to do. I uh, wish I had some of the tools that you have to keep the legislative body that I work with in line, a balanced budget amendment and a line of <coughs> authority. I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't invite you here to lecture. You, I want to hear what's on your mind, so Tom, is the new chairman, why don't you start off? Excuse me, Mr. President. We have one group of still photographers. We want to bring in person to take a picture before the governor starts. I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but you know, for some of you, you're going to feel like the last words of the Last Supper. And you to get in the picture should be on this side of the table. This is better. Usually they come with standards, but they never that. These are the last dictators in America. So you have to deal with them. How to do it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. You know, I've had a session like that only with about four times that many when the previous to this Prime Minister of Japan was visiting. He just sat there fascinated. Just <laughs> spelled. Thank <laughs> you. 
are the eagle leaders of the inaugural anniversary of dinner dance, and uh, they're the ones who raise all the money for the Republican Party for the eagle program. We really appreciate your taking the time to meet with us today, and thank you very much. Well, listen, I'm pleased to meet with the leadership of the fifth annual inaugural anniversary dinner dance, and it's especially nice to see our party chairman, Frank Ferencloff, and national finance chairman, Keith Brown, and uh, We've both been very instrumental in the success of the Republican Party, and in particular the Eagles program. And I'd like to give my special thanks to Ambassador John Gavin, who's National Dinner Chairman, and Maureen Reagan, <laughs> National Dinner Chairwoman. And uh, each of you here have been tireless in your efforts to support me and the Republican Party. And I want you to know how much Nancy and I appreciate that all that you've done. We've all given back to America, saw the success you've realized, not only have you given freely of personal resources, but also of your time. The Eagles are such a vital part of the Republican Party. Since 1975, you alone have contributed $56 million to the Republican Party, and all that we've accomplished together uh, would not have been possible uh, without you, without that. As a democratic politico in California used to say, money is the mother's milk of politics. <laughs> Nancy and I are looking forward to being with you again at, the, at this wonderful celebration on February 12th. With each of you working to raise funds for this important event, I know that this year's dance will be the most successful ever. And uh, with that, I won't make you listen to a, any more of a speech out of me. But again, just a heartfelt thank you. We thank you, Mr. President, and uh, Maureen has been very nice to show us the Christmas decorations. I'm sure you, you and one on the horse, and then followed by another rolling out. Maybe no one told you, but his family a few years ago, his descendants, uh, brought this in first gift of its kind ever to the White House and presented, that's the Nobel Prize that Teddy Roosevelt won for ending the Japanese-Russian War. And uh, if it was purely a Republican gathering, I would point out that he did it in typical Republican fashion, or one of them, typical Republican fashion. He settled the war sitting on a yacht. <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen of this historic 100th Congress of the United States, I want you to know what an honor it is to welcome each of you here to the White House. And if I could address what some of you may be wondering, no, it isn't a dream. The campaign's actually over and you won. <laughs> in reading about you, I was struck by your diversity as a freshman class in both the national and well, from the only pitcher to pitch no hitters in both the National and American League, Jim Bunning, to the basketball star, Tom McMillan, from lawyers like Benjamin Cardin and Jay Rhodes, to a member of my own former profession, Fred Grandy. I knew Fred had been elected when Cap Weinberger sent me a request for a new aircraft carrier, six destroyers, and a love boat. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, knowing you'd be here today, I couldn't help thinking back to my own transition from acting to politics. When my old boss, Jack Warner of Warner Brothers, heard that I was running for governor in California, he said, no, Jimmy Stewart for governor, Ronald Reagan for best friend. <laughs> More than once during that campaign, I was reminded of a remark that was made by Jack's brother, uh, Harry Warner. The advent of soundtracks for movies back in the 20s. He said, who the heck wants to hear actors talk? <laughs> and I want to congratulate each of you. You once again are welcome to the grand, the grand stage of national policy. Certainly on matters of substance, many of us in this room will disagree. There'll be time enough for that later. For now, it's enough to consider where we would do well to agree. The country will demand of all of us, Republicans and Democrats alike, that we work together, always stressing the element in our national life that makes a 
national life possible at all, bipartisan cooperation. At all times, it'll be wise for you, as it is for every member of the House and Senate, to work with and through your leaders. This makes life easier for us here at the White House, because my staff and I meet with the leadership regularly. But it will also be in your own interest as members of Congress. For without the coordination that the leadership provides, the House and Senate alike would fall prey to fragmentation and inaction. Perhaps most important, let us agree that the correct motive force in politics is ideals. In the coming months, you'll find your ideals, along with your patience and stamina, sorely tested. You'll work long hours. You'll be subject to conflicting pressures. You will need to compromise to further your ideals, but you will also find yourself subjected to the temptation to compromise those ideals yourself. Permit me to quote one who both served in the House and held my office, and was the uncle of Joseph Kennedy, a member of this freshman class. In profile, Profiles in Courage, John Kennedy wrote this about the conscientious member of Congress. He realizes that once he begins to weigh each issue in terms of his chances for re-election, once he begins to compromise away his principles on one issue after another for fear that to do otherwise would halt his career and prevent future fights for principle, then he has lost the very freedom of conscience which justifies his continuance in office. So if you'll permit me, fight every political fight long and hard, but fight every fight in the name of principle. It'll be trying to balance the legitimate demands of constituents, party, colleagues, and family. The hours will be long and frequent travel often exhausting, but never doubt that it's worth it. To quote John Buchan, one of President Kennedy's favorite authors, public life is the crown of a career, and politics is still the greatest and most honorable adventure. When I spoke a moment ago about that travel, I can't help but tell you that you're going to have to get used to the phone operators around here, particularly in the White House. I, early on, just would pick up the phone and say, hey, would you get me so-and-so, and put the phone in the ring, and I'd pick it up, and there'd be so-and-so. And one day, it took quite a while for the phone to ring again, and when I got in, very jovial, I said, well, I was a congressman I was calling. I said, where did I find you? He said, in New Zealand. <laughs> I said, what time is it? <laughs> and he said, 4 a.m. <laughs> now, sometimes I point out, if there's some place, don't be <laughs> Thank you all, and God bless you. I think on the schedule, I've got a couple of minutes left here. Uh, not many more than that, but maybe one or two of you might have a question you'd like to ask him since this is a kind of indoctrination session for all of you. Did you really go to Mexico all those times? On <laughs> 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 you know, there's no illusion in that I was a frequent viewer. Really? <laughs> <laughs> they made it kind of tough for me to watch television here. But, um, well, no one has a question here? <laughs> Rather intimidated, Mr. President. <laughs> we don't know what to ask. <laughs> yes, they won't start a fight. <laughs> what was that last time? <laughs> I don't know what to ask. It won't, won't start, start a fight. fight. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, we have an orientation for us. What do they do for presidents? <laughs> <coughs> Just get them up in the morning. I think the most orientation I got was from. 11-year-old girl who wrote me a letter, told me all the things that she thought I should do, and you'd be surprised at 11 years, she had all the major issues. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Amy Carter. <laughs> <laughs> She wound up a letter and said, now get over to the Oval Office and go to work. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you, having been a governor, uh, I'll confess to you, it wasn't all that strange. I guess that's probably the nearest job to this job that there is in the country. And having eight years as a governor there, uh, other than now having added on a foreign policy, uh, it wasn't much different. The 
You, uh, you think you're in charge, but every morning there's a slip or a sheet of paper on your desk that tells you what you're going to do every 15 minutes. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, having just gotten through a, uh, uh, an election campaign, I just wanted to perhaps uh, remind uh, you of the plight of the poor and many of our senior citizens and hardworking American families that really are struggling uh, in our country today. And I know as you're preparing your budget for the, uh, on January 5th, I just hope that you'll uh, be cognizant of the plight of so many Americans that aren't having the kind of economic success that uh, uh, so, uh, uh, some of the few are. Well, let me assure you, of course, and I feel it is the responsibility of those of us in government to do everything we can for those who, through no fault of their own, cannot help themselves. And yes, there will be efforts to eliminate certain programs and there will be efforts to trim them down, but let me tell you why. Uh, when I came here, one of the discoveries I made in the federal government, well, as a matter of fact, I kind of made it when I was governor. I discovered that in many of those well-intentioned programs, passed with all the compassion that the people in government can have and should have, at the same time, the bureaucratic overload was such that in many of those programs, it was costing the federal government two dollars in overhead to deliver one dollar to a needy person. And I feel that we can find better ways to do it and to make those dollars go further and really help uh, the people they intend to help. Early on, I vetoed a, a job training bill. And I vetoed it because that bill was aimed at, uh, as I recall, 300,000 individuals to be helped and would cost $250 million in six months to do this. Now, by some of the things we've done to get this expansion going for four years, we have been averaging around 300,000 new jobs for people in this country every month. So it isn't a case of lacking compassion, and it isn't true that I ever wanted to do away with Social Security. Uh, there again, I found some problems uh, that were denied when I came here, but later admitted. When we started, Social Security was faced with being bankrupt by July of 1983. And after the 82 election was over, we did get together in a bipartisan commission, Congress and the administration here, and worked out a reform of Social Security that put it on a sound footing for as far as we can see into the future and uh, didn't deprive anyone uh, of what they needed in that program. Mr. President, I'm from Baltimore, and uh, this past uh, year you came to throw out the first pitch at the Orioles opening game. Mm -hmm. We finished in last place, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to New York this year? <laughs> No, and I tell you, I don't think I'm going to be invited back. <laughs> I've only been to a few Oreo games, and every one that I've been to, they lost. <laughs> so I think that knowing the superstition of athletes, I think they may have in mind that I'm a jinx for some reason or other. But uh, I do recall that I threw out that first ball. Maybe I should have known something was wrong when uh, I missed the catcher on the first pitch. <laughs> Mr. President, we understand the Speaker Wright is uh, gearing up for us to send back to you right away the Clean Water Act. Are you going to send it right back down to us? It is going to depend on whether you correct the thing that, was, that made me send the first one back down. And that was a cost that was so far out of line and that even our own people who would have to implement the program doubted that they could spend uh, that much money and use it. So, there were some things in there of that kind. Uh, it wasn't that I'm against clean water. It was just that, uh, again, it was one of those overhead problems that, which government is so frequently guilty. Just one question, Mr. President. I'm from Florida. Uh, the, uh, all of our country, I'm sure, is concerned about what is so prevalent in the press now. And uh, it would be helpful to us, I think, if you could give us uh, your judgment as to when we might put it behind us, when we might move on to uh, and, other and the, uh, and the, the Iranian uh, arms oh. 
No one wants it behind it more than I do. I, I think I'd, I'd like to call something to your attention on that. But the press, now for these last three weeks, has been going on day after day, hammering away at this. And everything that they know to ask about is what I told them. Because the thing is, of course, the transfer of funds, was there such a thing, how did it come about? And I absolutely had no information on that. Uh, the two individuals who've stepped down, who did know about it and uh, neglected it, <coughs> told them what we had learned and then went into the press room, took the Attorney General with me and told them what we had learned for the first time and that we were going to continue to investigate this and turned it over to them and for one hour he took their questions. Now I gave them all the information I had and within about 18 hours from when it was given to me and uh, now to see this uh, attempt apparently on the part of the press to indicate that I must be covering something up. Nobody wants it uncovered more than I do because I've told all I know and I'm glad about the committees that are going and we have now uh, uh, made a decision to ask for a, I keep calling them special prosecutor, but recently they've changed the name to independent counsel. But he's still a special prosecutor and uh, we want to get to the bottom of this as quickly as we can and find out, was there any criminal act? They're telling me I've overstayed my time here. I know, well, that'll be the last question. Hi, Mr. President, uh, I'm Ernie Kanye. I was born in Hungary and we're very concerned about uh, most favored nation treatment for Romania. Uh, which is repressing about 2.8 million Hungarian. Yours and prior administration have supported uh, 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 that kind of a treatment uh, for Romania. Is, is there any thoughts in your mind that, uh, based on Tom Lantis and my concerns, as well as others, that perhaps that can change? We are very conscious of that and the nature of the, the dictator there in that country. But at the same time, I think this came about under the previous administration because of his resistance to the kind of Soviet control that is imposed on the other uh, <coughs> nations in the communist bloc. And it was an effort on our part to kind of recognize that he was willing to stand up and oppose them and chart his own course. At the same time, I have to tell you, just as we are with the Soviet Union, we, we are trying behind the scenes to get more humane treatment and observance of human rights in that country. And you said you were from Hungary. Yes, sir. I have to tell you, you don't know the story that's going around in Hungary among the Hungarians. I kind of collect stories that I can find take place or are told behind the Iron Curtain that gives an indication of their real feeling, the people's feeling about their government. But this one was a young Hungarian Yano and his friend just across the border in the Soviet Union, Ivan, very close friends. And they were walking along the border one day and they came upon a treasure chest. And they were delighted. And Ivan turned to Yano and he said, Yano, let us divide this among it between us like true communist brothers. And Yano said, not in your life, we've split it 50-50. <laughs> Your statements about uh, public diplomacy and quiet diplomacy, I also liked very much. Thank you, sir. Well, we're glad to see you in the United States again, and that your family has been allowed to join you. And congratulations. I love the members. Oh, family. yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's really very pleasant. You suddenly become so rich having a daughter of all the years. We called you your Rachel, Rachel, because I, uh, Isaac worked for Rachel in Biden for 14 years, and we were working for 13 years, <laughs> a little bit less. Yeah. Well, well, listen, we're, uh, this whole matter, and I know what you're doing, and we have to ask him the next thing. We're, uh, we're going to start.
chance to shake hands with all of you when you leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Mr. President, the wave of photographers is going to come in first, and we just have to kind of mark time. Oh, I see. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that you're making by serving on the U.S. Savings Bond Committee. Bob, you and the 1986 members have turned in one of the best performances ever. We haven't had so many months when bond sales exceeded a billion dollars since the World War II years. I congratulate each of you and want you to know that Jim Baker and I deeply appreciate all of your efforts in making the 1986 bond drive the most successful one since 1945. As for the 1987 campaign, John, you and your committee have quite a challenge before you. And I thank each of you for volunteering to lead next year's bond drive. You have my best wishes for a successful campaign, and all of you have your country's gratitude for all your efforts. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Let me add before I mention some good things about our campaign that. Uh, Everyone in this room is totally in back of you, and, and you should know that. We're proud of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We almost had a substitution here. I mentioned that, uh, at lunch that uh, Jimmy Goldson had almost bought uh, Goodyear. Well, <laughs> But I'm, I'm glad that I was able to make it. The guy, had wanted to, if he'd wanted to blimp ride that bad, he could have told me. <laughs> I'm very proud of the championship team that we have. And if you'll excuse the picture here, there are three bullets here that tell us really what happened. We now have over $90 million billion, the highest amount in history. And savings bonds in 86 of nearly $10 billion are doubled last year's sales. And more than 1.9 million Americans invested for the first time or increased their participation in the payroll savings plan, exceeding our goal by nearly 27%. And last year set record by 200,000 individuals. And I'm very proud to present you with this report, to thank you for the support. You did some spots for us that were just superb, and I think that put us over the top. Uh, Jim Baker and Kay Ortega and their <coughs> tremendously talented staff did a great job for us, and uh, I'm just so proud to, uh, to present this to you. Well, thank you very much. I, I guess I learned a little about how to do this when I was doing GE Theater. <laughs> 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 the GE Theater, remember, I remember that. <laughs> well, Mr. President, I would like to uh, first congratulate Bob and and the 86 team for the great job that, that they did. But I want to assure you that we have an even better team lined up for 1987, <laughs> and uh, that we will exceed the, uh, the performance in 1986, as long as uh, Secretary Baker doesn't fool around with the rates anymore. <laughs> but, uh, hey, let me just make one thing clear. <laughs> Only the President of the United States can make it. <laughs> <laughs> now we know. <laughs> I was going to try to start off our campaign by selling you a savings bond, but we couldn't get it orchestrated quickly enough. But I will try to get back to saving money. <laughs> I also thought that if I had a life insurance policy, you know, being a metropolitan life, I might have sold you life insurance. <laughs> I was discouraged from doing that. But anyway, uh, 
I am pleased, uh, Mr. President, to uh, present you with a copy of the brochure that we've put together for the uh, 1987 campaign, uh, where uh, the, the theme for the campaign is uh, U.S. savings bonds, the great American investment. We think it is a great American investment on a variety of counts. And we tried in the brochure to uh, make it people-oriented. We have five people here from each of uh, five of the companies that have been participants in the program, General Motors, Ford Warner, Goodyear, Metropolitan Life, and next year, uh, Manufacturers Hanover. And so there's a little story about each of them and some good pictures, a great picture of you, and Secretary Baker. And there's even one that, I mean, uh, it made me look good, which is difficult. But uh, uh, each of them has a little story to tell about why they've invested in savings bonds. And, uh, and I think you'll be proud of uh, you know, how they have expressed themselves. And so uh, we, uh, we think that we're, uh, we're off to a good start. And, uh, and we all welcome the opportunity to do this and promise you that next year when we're back, we will be <coughs> reporting a very successful year. Well, thank you very much. Again, I thank you all. I think I'm supposed to have the opportunity now to meet each one down here at the end of the room, am I not? I think that's right, Mr. President. Before we do that, may I, everybody in this room has heard you tell jokes about age. And I, I just think it'd be great if Bob Mercer told you the story he told us, <laughs> which, is a, which is a selling tool that he's used in here in the 1986. I, I got worked up, Mr. President, in trying to convince some of our retirees that they should be buying uh, savings bonds. And one of them said, when do they mature? And I said, well, within 10 years. And he said, look, Sonny, at my age, I don't even buy green bananas. <laughs> I have to return the favor and give you one I just heard the other day. <laughs> you see, stories about age, that's the only ethnic humor I can engage in. <laughs> this, was a, this was a golfer, 86 years old, and he finally plaintively said to his fellow club members that he was going to have to give up golf. He could see, still hit the ball, but he couldn't see anymore where it went. But one of the members said, wait a minute. I've got a golf partner for you that I think can take care of that and you won't have to give up golf. He said he's 95 years old and he just plays a great game of golf. So I brought him and introduced him. 86 year old told his problem. He said, wait a minute, that's all right. He says, I can see as good as when I was 12 years old. He said, I can see the ball for you. So they stood up in the first tee, they both drove, and got in the cart and started down the fairway and the 86 year old driving said, well, did you see where my drive went? And he said, oh, yes, I saw it every foot of the way. He says, where did it go? He says, I don't remember. <laughs>